Um, just by way of introduction, um, uh, I'm Paul <coughs> Lee Placer, and this is Lynn Maloney. So I'm the president, I'm Lynn Maloney, I'm the treasurer. And um, we're pinch hitting for Tracy tonight, and we're also being filmed um, by Pat Holt, multiple expert people. videographer. <laughs> Um, who does a lot of, of video around town. So, um, and we'll probably be busy this weekend at True Falls, I imagine. So, um, just by way of introduction, uh, Race Matters Friends has focused consistently on policing and social equity as a means to address racial disparities, as well as issues of transparency and accountability in city government. So that's going to be a, those things, as big as they are, I mean, not narrowing it very much, but those will be our focus this evening. Um, and so we also hope that the responses from the candidates should reflect and take into account the needs of those most marginalized in our community. We know that you hear a lot from, from people with property, wealth, that kind of thing. They have their interests in the community. We're focused on, on people who are the most marginalized, the people who uh, might often be over-policed, over-arrested, over-incarcerated, or um, uh, likely to be lower income or have issues with education, housing, those kinds of things. So to open it off, um, we wanted to ask each one of you, what is your definition uh, or definitions of um, three key terms for us? One is inclusion, <coughs> one is equity, and one is social justice. How much time do they have for each of these? And if you need to take three minutes, it's not it's time <laughs> issues. And who wants to start? Should we start with you? I'll be happy to stop thinking if that's okay with you guys. So in my definitions, inclusion is the process by which organizations and cultures are welcoming to all people. Um, there has been a tendency in our society for different types of people to aggregate together with people of their own type, particularly in the area of race. And race is the, uh, the most visible area where inclusion can happen. And an inclusive organization or an inclusive community or an inclusive culture goes out of its way to be welcoming and open to uh, people of other races to join and feel comfortable as a part of that group. And it's a lot more difficult than, than I thought it was when I first started learning about things like diversity and inclusion. It's a lot more complicated and it's easy to try to do the work of inclusion and make mistakes along the way. Uh, especially if you're a person of privilege in the privileged class. So I have learned uh, a lot over the last few years as I've studied this, and um, I continue to practice what I've learned and to try to learn more. Um, I think I'm going to jump to social justice next, sure. if that's okay. Um, as I've become more involved in public policy at the local level and at the national and international level, I've become increasingly aware and conv increasingly convinced uh, uh, about two myths, that they are indeed myths. Uh, the first myth is the myth of meritocracy, which states that if people are in a better place, socially, financially, uh, in the class, uh, they have somehow earned it. They deserve it, they lay the word harder, or they're more intelligent, or they're more uh, skillful, and therefore there is a, a sort of a hierarchy in our society, whether it's in the United States of America, or it's in Colombia, look at the whole world, where some people deserve more than others because of this meritocracy. Uh, I'm convinced that that's a myth, and I feel it should be spoken more often that that's a myth. Uh, the real reason that there are hierarchies is not because people have earned it, uh, but because of uh, atrocities and uh, discrimination and uh, really some of the worst traits of human behavior. Um, so that's the first myth. The second myth is the myth that people who are uh, considered towards the bottom of that hierarchy, working class people, um, 
uh, people who take uh, government uh, social support um, are actually happy in that situation and uh, are lazy and don't want to work hard, don't want to be part of the society. In my research and meeting with people and asking people and talking to people, it's very clear that almost nobody is happy with that kind of situation. Um, so with those two myths in mind, um, social justice is the process, or social justice is perhaps the outcome of uh, leveling that playing field. Uh, is that my three minutes? So equity is the strategy by which we get there by, by providing appropriate supports for people who have less and ensuring we all have equal opportunity. Yeah, tie it right together. <laughs> okay, Mr. Kelly. Ian's comments on inclusion were articulate and complete. I would only add this, that when you have a society where the wealth has been based by systematic legal exclusion, then the society itself, the legal structure of the society, bears a greater obligation to cure the failures, the exclusive failures of the past to provide um, inclusion. Um, there's a lot of reasons why I am excluded from professional football, not because of any evil act on the part of the National Football League, but only because of my own incompetence. Um, and that's different. There's no law that kept me out. But we had laws which for many years kept many people out. Um, and so I think we have a greater obligation to, uh, to act affirmatively. Um, social justice is, has both a political and a legal component to it. Um, it's reasonable and correct to use the law to achieve social justice. But so the law alone cannot achieve social justice. You also have to act to achieve social justice. And through my entire time of being involved in community organization, nobody ever gave any oppressed group anything. You have to take it. You have to, by earn, when I say earn it, I mean earn it politically by taking it from the ruling class. It's never a gift. Power is never a gift. It's always a matter of one's own assertion of the right to a full share in society. Um, and equity is, I think, kind of a, a target, probably an ephemeral target, that most many people strive to get to where one's gender, one's race, one's physical or emotional um, challenges don't result in them having a disadvantage, but you have the, everyone has is actually equal on the playing field. Um, and that there are no societal or economic barriers to uh, full inclusion in in the society and the, the benefits of being in the society. Um, I think I'll put there. On. Well, before we we'll wait till everybody feels welcome and uh, comfortable before we go on to the next question. Welcome everybody. And if you are new to our group, we have some welcome packets. We'll get those to you. Um, okay, we're going to move to the topic of policing which has taken up a lot of our time in um, Race Matters Friends over the past couple of years, three years, four years, whatever. Um, so um, we witnessed this past year the failure of the city manager and CPD to create a viable plan for department-wide community-oriented needs um, in response to the council's resolution to create such a different plan. Now, what do you see as council's role and the mayor's role in implementing community-oriented policing for the city, and what next steps can we take? What do you plan you to take? You said mayor, so 
Maybe I'll go first on this one? Sure. sure. All right. Um, first of all, the failure, I think, extends far further back than last year. Oh, absolutely. And, and second, I think there were significant failures in the last year. Um, I think that it's really important, given the nature of the charter, to remember that the hiring of the chief is the, the role of the manager and the manager alone. However, assuming that I am elected, one of the factors that will inform my decision on manager and that I'll be very specific about um, my inquiries with the candidates for manager is how does he or she intend to proceed on choosing a chief? What are going to be the characteristics that you're looking for? And I will be looking for in the answers someone who is going to affirmatively seek a chief that will, the chief that they seek has got to be very dedicated to going out of their way to find someone who's going to make sure that the police act in a way that is no longer specifically inappropriate with regard to race as we have had in Columbia, Missouri. Um, see, the, the, one of the things that's important to remember about the police is that the police govern primarily low-income people. The problem, you know, if you remember back to the New Orleans flood, there was pictures of black kids running through the water with TVs, right? And the press said, see the kids, read black kids, looting TVs. Well, now the problem with those kids is that they chose their targets poorly. They should have looted pension funds <laughs> instead of televisions. The money's way better, the police enforcement is way worse, and the possibility of jail is way worse. But see, the police structure is not focused on the people who loot pension funds. It's focused on the people who loot TVs. That's a big mistake in our society. Um, but that's the world we live in. Given that's the world we live in, the police have to understand that because they are focused on people of lower economic status, that they can't always be seeing them as the enemy, as the bad guy. They've got to see them as citizens first until those folks demonstrate some inappropriate behavior. And that's the problem. When, when they look at a given person on the street, what do they see? Do they see a kid or do they see a perp? That's really important how they see that person on the street. And believe me, as a judge, I saw a lot of this. Um, it, when you see a perp, you're going to respond differently than if you see a kid. Um, hey, another that, reason. That was your, your time. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I'm sorry if you couldn't hear the. Uh, no, I, I heard it. I just didn't register. Oh, OK. You know, okay. I'm sorry. Well, okay. I thought maybe we needed to. I'll quit. Um, and as a sponsor of the resolution that was not implemented, um, do you have any ideas about what should happen now? Well, as Chris said, um, the city council does not have a direct role over the police chief or the police department. All of our action is channeled through the city manager. And I have been a very strong proponent for community-oriented policing for uh, well over three years, the whole of my last term. It was part of my platform three years ago, and it's part of my platform again. I am encouraged where we are now, but it's been a rough three years. Um, community policing, as I, as I define it, is uh, it's the strategy that responds to the existential problem of policing, um, which Chris described uh, rather well. We empower certain government employees with deadly force, and we have to have very special processes to ensure that that is used only uh, appropriately. Um, so community policing is a uh, program that's designed by the community in partnership with police professionals. 
because of the um, segregated structure of our neighborhoods and our society, it involves a lot of outreach. And good community police officers have to be really good communicators, and they have to enjoy building relationships and people keeping people safe uh, in their neighborhoods. Um, and um, a good community police uh, program will be able to respond to alarming data, such as the, so the um, uh, Attorney General's uh, Vehicle Stops Report, which has been published several times in recent years, has been published annually, and shows a, an enormous disparity between the likelihood of an African-American driver to be pulled over and searched uh, versus a white driver. And there have to be answers to that. Uh, the fact that those answers were not forthcoming and there was really no interest in, 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 in trying to answer them uh, was a big red flag that there was a huge problem with our police department. So I pushed in a lot of different ways. Um, and finally, the resolution that, um, um, that Peggy just referred to, which was uh, passed unanimously by the council about a year ago, uh, directed the city manager to design Columbia's community policing program um, and um, that patently did not happen. I very much appreciate Grace Mouse Friends' uh, plan and report that was produced about the same time and was something like what I was hoping that the city manager and his uh, staff would do, but, but they didn't. In fact, what I, what I saw, experienced in that report, in that, in that document, was the status quo rigidifying and pushing back and refusing to change. It was, a, it was a blatant, no, we're not gonna do this, to me. And that was the point at which I decided, personally, that we had to take even more extreme action, namely, uh, try to get a new city manager. And I had supported Mike Mathis over and over again, up to that point, but at that point, uh, I, I proposed to the rest of the city council that we ask for his resignation. The rest of the council agreed, and uh, he resigned the next day. I don't think we've done justice to this yet, so if you have time at the end, I think it's really worth coming back to this question, because this is the number one issue, I think. Um, so. We have seven more issues, questions about police. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> oh, you do have get a chance. Yeah, okay. get a chance to talk about it. Yeah, I, and I think, um, yeah, I think we'll get to that in the next couple of questions. Okay. Awesome. Um, I realize, as, as Mr. Kelly explained, we are, the council and mayor are a step removed from the hiring and firing of the chief. Um, but if, suppose, a city manager came to you and said, um, what, are, what should we be looking for? Um, what kind of leader should we be seeking in a new chief? And I, I hope that the community will be asked that question as well. Um, what would you say? Um, should we just keep alternating? Sure, I'll take works. this one first. Yeah. Um, well, I've defined community policing as, as I understand it, and I would want to see a police chief who has experience in community policing, who understands what the philosophy of community policing means, and knows how to translate that into actual policies and practices within the police department, training regimes, and, and uh, communication strategies uh, to, to build that trust. It's really all about trust building between the police professionals and uh, the members of the neighborhoods where a lot of the crime happens, but all people in the community ideally will support our police department operating a community policing program. Um, I have to say, uh, before uh, Mike Mathis resigned, my so the goal was that we would have a new city manager from uh, outside the city of Columbia who had uh, experience managing a police department or overseeing a police chief in a community policing uh, community uh, and a police chief with that experience, again, from outside the community. Uh, I knew Jeff Jones very well, have known him for many years since he was initially appointed as the lieutenant over our pilot community policing program, the Columbia Outreach Unit, which is the community outreach unit, which has been very successful, but I didn't think, I have to say, I, I felt that if he were police chief, the um, culture of that department would be, and the fact that he came from within, would make it hard for him to have a positive impact. However, 
I am delighted to say that I am being proved wrong at the moment. Um, I was happy, very happy that John Glasscock appointed Jeff as the interim police chief. Everything he's done uh, has been excellent from my point of view. I don't want to put ideas into anybody else's head, but I couldn't have asked for more. His, his statements when he was first appointment, his consideration of whether he might be interested in the permanent job, and the amount of work that he's done in, in I think, like less than three weeks now, meeting with uh, enormous numbers of the officers. He's got on a schedule to meet with everybody in the department one-on-one, -on -one, um, discussing policies um, uh, and um, setting a clear direction. We're, we haven't had this kind of leadership in the police department well, ever in my experience in Columbia, and I'm just delighted. So somebody like Jeff Jones would be the person I, I'd want to see as the permanent <laughs> police chief. Remember what I talked before about nobody ever gives you power. Jeff's response to the job and his affirmative commitment to doing exactly the things that Ian talked about is a direct response to the fact that the community has demanded a different situation with the police department. Had there not been a demand from primarily the African American community and many other people, that would, I believe, not have occurred. We have seen a tremendous renaissance in the last three weeks in the attitude of the police chief, and I think it is appropriate response to heavy duty and appropriate political pressure. Um, sadly, Columbia, Missouri is not the only town in the United States of America facing the need to confront these kinds of problems with the police department. Happily, many of those communities have also gone through the process that we're going through now. That means that there are cops out there, high-ranking cops, who have significant experience in this area and proven track records. I think that group of officers from around the country provides a, at least a reasonable pool of possible applicants to attract, to recruit, to check out, to wonder about their, their willingness to come, you know. Um, so while I think, it, I think it would be bad for Jeff and bad for all of us if he were simply to be anointed police chief because then it would look like an inside job. He, let's even assume he was the very best person in the world for the job. But were he, were the council or the, uh, uh, the uh, manager to say tomorrow, oh, guess what, you're anointed chief, probably very bad, even if it were the right selection, because it would appear to be, you know, and the appearance would be bad. But as we go through this process, I think that we, uh, this is a nice enough town, this is a wonderful town, that we can look at some of those people from other communities who have gone through the same struggle that we now face, or are in the same struggle that we face, because there's a bunch of them, isn't there? And that means there's a bunch of lieutenants and captains and, and assistant chiefs out there who have gone through the process. Um, I think that we've also looked at the force long enough to understand where the core of the problem is in the department. And I think the core of the problem, the core of the problem is certainly certain forces within the union. Um, well, that's the end of the talk. See how good I am? Stop. Yeah. <laughs> um, you, are you were just getting into one of the uh, hot topics there. That's right. <laughs> the the uh, police union. I didn't even think we had a question about it, but we should have. And uh, remember that, everybody in the audience, and we have We'll have time for open questions if you have a question about that. Um, so, given that there is some remove from the hiring and firing of the chief, but that you can always advise, um, what is the proper role or level of involvement of the council and the mayor in relation to the police department and their policies? Um, are there are there means of influence and and one thing that we had um, uh, 
have a lot of discussion about is the Citizens Police Review Board, which is us, and um, also the Vehicle Stops Report, which is um, comes before council and has raised a lot of public comment. And so um, those are two areas where uh, there seems to have been a role for council and the, and the mayor to have something to say, but how do you um, breach that wall of division with the police department? Well, we are in an interesting situation because normally, technically at least, the council would have no role, would they? Purely a manager decision. But right now, we do have a significant role because we can make inquiry into the thinking of the manager candidates on this. And so that's where the council will have an unusually strong ability to have some input into the hiring of the chief. Um, that was part of your question. And what was the rest of your question? Well, the other, another area is the Citizens Police Review Board. Oh, yeah. And that has been um, in the news lately because one of the um, members had said um, this group is toothless. It really is supposed to review the operation of the police or complaints about the police, but they don't get to address them because the, at least this person felt the city staff blocked that kind of citizen review or citizen action in relation to the police department. There is no police force probably in the United States of America that doesn't at least to some degree resent and suspect its civilian review board. It's probably absolutely endemic and that's probably an appropriate tension to have. That doesn't make the, the review board wrong. It just means that that's an appropriate tension. I think that the board, if, if members of the board feel that it's toothless, there's probably a reasonable argument to believe that it at least has very teeny little teeth um, maybe that might not be entirely toothless, but it's probably a valid criticism because every administration and every police department is going to push back against a, a civilian review board. And that's no reason to cut off or, or make the police board weaker or abolish it. It may be you have to reevaluate the way that the police department and or the manager staff relate to the police board. It may mean that you need to seek even more aggressive members. It may mean that sometimes there may be members of the police board, and I don't say that's true in our case, but it certainly happens a lot, where there's people on the review board who are using the review board for their own political or social um, purposes. That's true too, you know, they could certainly manipulate the process um, but I think that the, the feelings of some of the members of the police review board that they're not given enough abil ability to participate is well-founded. Uh, in a healthy uh, council manager form of government, um, the council does not directly uh, influence or supervise the department heads, uh, but works through the city manager, as I mentioned earlier. That process requires trust. There's nothing wrong with the city council speaking as a body to the manager about things in a certain department or one-on-one -on -one in, in informal uh, talks that uh, the council members have with the city manager. And if there is a healthy, trusting relationship down the line, then those uh, uh, opinions and influences will be filtered through the city manager and will be implemented in whichever department uh, uh, was was uh, at the center of those discussions. What we had uh, up until November was a broken system where the trust really wasn't there between the council and the manager and the police chief and the department. And uh, the the attempt to use that system as it should operate when when the system's healthy failed because of that. And um, now. I, I believe we have a very healthy system with our interim city manager and our interim police chief, and, and I see things uh, working much better, and I also uh, am very optimistic that when we hire our permanent 
uh, city manager and when the city manager hires the permanent police chief that um, those uh, healthy relationships will continue. Um, but uh, as you mentioned, the Citizens Police Review Board is another kind of check and balance, another part of this, uh, of this whole system. The Citizens Police Review Board is appointed by the City Council and answers to the City Council. Uh, their establishing ordinance uh, describes their activities, which uh, include reviewing uh, uh, co complaints of police action, uh, after they have been initially reviewed by internal affairs in the police department, if the complainant is not satisfied, then the complainant can then take them to the uh, CPRB for further analysis and review, as well as other roles around studying and, and making suggestions for changes in police policy and practice. Um, and um, it's very interesting, that is written into the ordinance, uh, the establishing ordinance of CPRB. When I was trying to get a community engagement process around policing organized, I rewrote the resolution about 10 times, giving authority to a different body in each case to take charge of this. And one of the best ones, I thought, was the CPRB. I thought, we'll pass a resolution that asks the CPRB to facilitate a community engagement process about policing. I got a lot of pushback from the city staff, from the uh, staff liaison to the CPRB, who's a member of the law department, and I was told that, that this wasn't part of their remit, that they were far too busy, and, and I, I wanted to push it, but I kind of made the decision to um, honor the staff's request and not, not push it. Um, but having talked to Bill Davis uh, multiple times and learned more about what goes on in CPRB, I now feel stronger than ever that the council needs to uh, um, take more of a role uh, to assert you know, how we would like the CPRB to serve us and potentially to have a joint work session with the CPRB following their last meeting where they kind of said, we're not quite sure what we're supposed to be doing. Did I leave any time on this question? No, uh, did, did, um, did I have any time left? Did you have time left on that question? Yes, yes you did. Well, because I wanted to. Ian has a, will have a better sense of this, but I think that because the council appoints the board, the council has more of an opportunity to meet directly with the board, as you say, in a, in a joint session and talk through why don't you think you're able to get your job done than, for instance, with the water and light staff. Don't you, don't you think that's, I, that's why I like your, your joint meeting with the two of them idea a lot? Um, I think that I maybe disagree with Ian about the police board having a role in the way that you described because their role is quasi-judicial, isn't it? It's kind of making decisions about actions taken by the police department. And if you're going to be in that kind of decision-making role, maybe you don't want to have it um, mixed in with administrative functions, and I'm not sure about that. It's just a kind of intellectual query I have about that. Well, uh, um, you both refer to this structure that we have, you know, and this is a, a ad lib question, but is there anything that you would change about this structure? Whether it would be changing in the, the state firewall between the chief and the, uh, and, uh, the elected body, or um, the role of the CPRB, or the manager and the council? Is there anything about any of these structures we've talked about so far that you would change if you had your wish list? I guess the only thing I have concerns about, um, and it's outside the uh, domain of the City of Columbia, is the state law that makes it very difficult for a city manager to hire a police chief in Missouri. And that was what the previous city manager told us all the time, was why he couldn't really exert pressure on him, on the previous police chief, and supervise him in the way council and the community wanted. In retrospect, I think that that was false, because the interim city manager uh, managed to make some moves that resulted in the police chief leaving, so I think it would have been perfectly possible for the previous city manager to do that. That, that, that's pr a problematic uh, statute in my view, um, and I'd like to, cons you know, to, uh, I haven't studied it in depth, but um, 
it definitely uh, creates a problem for a city manager supervising an underperforming police chief, and I don't think we should ever have that. Um, I don't have specific suggestions for other structural changes within the city. I do think it's appropriate that the uh, city council appoints the CPRB members. I do think it's appropriate that it is actually, it's already in the establishing ordinance of the CPRB that they can review policy and weigh in on that. Uh, and I wouldn't want to change that. And probably what I'd want to do, as I said before, would be to have a joint work session with the CPRB members and the city council to talk about, listen to them, what their experience of the work they do on the CPRB, what their perception of what they're doing for council, our perception of what we want them to be doing for us and um, um, come up with maybe some, you know, possibly be a resolution or just a new understanding of how we, uh, of how we move forward. And I have the staff in the room there because that's always an awkward thing, not just in the CPRB, but all of our boards and commissions. The staff put quite a bit of time into managing those meetings and, and um, you know, making sure the open meetings records and the laws are followed and so on. And that can sometimes get awkward, not just with CPRB, but with other boards and commissions where the city staff are, are involved in those discussions. Um, I don't think there's an easy answer to that, but I do really like, I'm very proud to be a member of the city council in a city that has more than 50 of these boards and commissions, hundreds and hundreds of citizen uh, advocates uh, with experience in different areas helping the city council uh, make legislation uh, through these different boards and commissions. I think Ian's right on both of his important points. First, the state law is terrible. It's an incredible intrusion to the right of municipal government to deal with its own affairs. Second, there ain't nothing broke, really, about the appointment of the, C, the review board. I think the problem is in the perhaps benign neglect of the power that maybe the council hasn't quite protected the, the review board enough. And that's what you get from his joint meeting. Say, listen, you guys got to take care of us. You got when we want to do something, you got to make sure that the, the staff doesn't turn shut us off. And that's exactly the kind of thing that can come out of that <coughs> joint meeting. So I think Ian's right on both of those important points. And but I don't think it's, I think the council should appoint it, and I think that it should have a strong reviewability and should provide its information to the council. I don't think the structure's broke. I think we, we as a community, have not done a good enough job in implementing it. Before we leave the issue of policing, you said that you might want to revisit or expand upon the community-oriented policing question. Is there anything either one of you would add about that to your uh, responses about that? Yeah, I do. I believe that this department, like many other human endeavors, has a core of inappropriately behaving individuals. I think the, that core can be found in the union. And I think that one of the most, perhaps the most important function of the new chief, I mean, I'm not mincing any words here, the guy, people here in this room who have known me for a long time know that I'm not going to mince words about this. The internal operation of the union is a problem, and it's a problem specifically with regard to race. And I think that if you're going to get to the problem, the new chief is going to have to confront that very, very directly. I happen to believe, by the way, that uh, Chief Jones is, at least from what I hear, starting to do that. Um, well, I'll just add that um, the difficulties in the police department have been focused on the CPOA, have been illustrated by statements and actions of the CPOA for sure. Um, however, it's tremendously encouraging to me that the CPOA endorsed the appointment of interim Chief Jones um, and are apparently rallying behind him and it gives me new faith that a good leader can manage all of these disparate, you know, political forces within an agency 
and get it pointing in the right direction. So I remain optimistic. So even if it came down to there's a problematic officer and he has to discipline that officer and CPOA wants to defend the officer, could you foresee some some continuing tensions there? I don't want to speculate okay. on a very <laughs> specific okay. nuts and bolts <laughs> issue like that. Okay. Well, let's move on to social equity. Um, can, can we get some other questions? In sure. Get, I'm just wondering because uh, you know, years ago, Abraham Kaplan wrote a wonderful book called The Conduct of Inquiry, which is a methodology book for the social sciences. And in there, he had a formulation of what he called the law of the instrument. Give a small boy a hammer. And he soon discovers that everything he encounters needs a speed spot uh, We have a SWAT team in the police department. We have a police department is much less than others, but is just starting to acquire some military equipment. I'm wondering about the appropriateness of that and what, what you think about that in terms of how policing gets it done, because that's part of the structure. Yeah. My turn, Albert? I think so, yeah, go ahead. For 30 years, I have believed that the militarization of the police is a tragic error. And cops are mostly guys. And guys love stuff. They love that equipment, don't they? Don't we? We do. We like those little tanks and we like the vests, and we like the guns, and we like the tear gas, and all that stuff. But that adds up to a militarizing force. And the problem with a militarizing force is it tends to colonialize. And we will see, it's a, the hammer analogy is perfect, because if you are an invading force, an occupying force, then you tend to see the people that you're occupying as the enemy, don't you? Rather than that the people whose job it is to serve, your job to serve and protect. There is a huge difference between the American soldier in Berlin, not in Berlin, because they Russians went to Berlin, but in Germany, and the role of the policeman in the little tiny idyllic community that I grew up in, huh? huge difference. I think that when you, that military equipment is only the outward manifestation of the problem with militarization of the police, but it is a real significant indicator of attitude about this. And I think we ought to break far away from the entire military. There's a big, big difference between a soldier and a policeman. And that difference is how we see the people that we're relating to. I think it's, and we've gone way, way over the line. Uh, and I oppose the uh, militarization of uh, community police uh, agencies as well. Uh, it's, uh, as I understand it, part of a, a sort of an economic process by which the uh, federal government gets rid of uh, slightly older equipment so that the military uh, industrial manufacturing sector can sell more to them and um, enormous uh, proportion of our federal budget goes on military spending and a lot of it is just updating and replacing equipment and then that other equipment so it's a it's a very sad and, and, and tragic cycle especially when that equipment uh, results in, in loss of life um, and um, but, but, but I think um, another issue that we have to bring up here is the uh, widespread availability of firearms in the public. And I grew up in a place where nobody has a gun and no police officers have a gun. There is a very small branch of the British police that are authorized to carry weapons. Now, I don't know what we do right now. I mean, the, the horse is out of the barn. There are just enormous numbers of weapons, but I'm encouraged by um, a, a buyback that took place in Australia that has greatly reduced the number of 
uh, fatal of, of lethal weapons that are available on the streets, and I would like to see something like that happen in the United States and just ratchet down the potential for violence by reining in those, those killer weapons. But guns are a huge problem, and it's especially because if you think about a 17-year-old boy, just a 17-year-old boy who doesn't feel himself oppressed, he loves guns. I mean, it's the very nature of the, those guys, those people on the planet, and it's a problem. And if you put them in a position of they, where they feel threatened by one another as well as by the police, if you make them feel like they're part of a colonialized people, the the desire, at least the justification in their own minds to have that gun, is huge. It's just gigantic, and it, Ian's absolutely right. The guns, and besides, now to be fair to the police and the militarization, the guns are a huge problem and the police are legitimately concerned about that and legitimately have to be concerned about it because the guns are there and there's a lot of them and they're bad for the kids and they're bad for the police and they're bad for everybody. Well, social equity, I mean, it's not that it's not related to what we've been discussing, but a short five years ago, we had the Mayor's Task Force on Community Violence. And that group generated, and we have members of that group, generated a set of very strong recommendations that have yet to be implemented. And they did not include only police reforms, they included issues like social services, housing, poverty, other things that contributed, they felt, to community violence, um, and health care, um, neighborhoods. Um, so beyond the police, what are things we can do to create um, a better community? Uh, might have first. Yeah, I think it is. Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, we have uh, structural st people who are structurally disadvantaged by the s institutions and systems that have been in place for generations. And the goal of equity is to adjust those structures and to uh, provide opportunities for people that are currently denied opportunities uh, through no fault or failure of their own. Um, some of the, it, it, it's a, without dismantling entire institutions, it's necessary to, to push on certain levers that can make changes here and there. And um, one of them is community policing. We already talked about that. That is less pushing a lever to actually assist people to um, gain more access to equal opportunity, uh, but taking away something that is uh, a, a barrier and a challenge for people in economically or educationally or otherwise disadvantaged situations. But two levers that I think can really help are uh, public transportation and affordable housing. Um, at the moment uh, in, in Colombia, it is uh, virtually impossible to run your life without owning a car. And that creates an enormous burden on anybody that can't afford to own a car. It's shocking to some people, but it actually costs, on average, $9,000 a year to own and operate a car in the United States. And there are plenty of low-income families that are virtually forced to own two cars. And if they're the average car-owning family, that's $18,000 a year right there. Um, we could provide the transportation services, access to mobility that people need, that that two-car family could become a one-car family and save $9,000 a year and, and use multiple modes of transportation within the context of a, of a, of a family. Or that some people could go car-free. Um, but at the moment, the community and the city council does not value public transportation adequately to invest in it. There's a lot of sense that there's something fundamentally wrong with our public transit system uh, that can never be fixed. But it's really simple we don't put enough money into it. We put about a fifth as much money into our public transit system per capita as the cities of Champaign-Urbana do, uh, about a quarter as much as Ames, Iowa does, and about a third as much as Lawrence, Kansas does. So uh, an important part, really the number one 
goal for me in this campaign and in the next three years on the council is to increase the budget of the public transit service so we can raise that up, we can provide better services to the people that currently have no choice, and we can also provide a service that is good enough that people like us who don't use public transit very regularly will start to use it and it'll become a true community amenity. The other one's affordable housing, but I didn't have time well, to talk we'll about that. Well, we'll get back to that because I, I, I see there are at least four or five big things under this social equity, and so we could probably just go back and forth around those, but um, transportation, housing, health, jobs, um, I don't know where you would like to start with it. Um, but, uh, every single person in this room can make the generalized, vague, big social goal speech about this subject as I can. Because you wouldn't be in this room if you couldn't. Um, so I want to drill down on two specifics. Um, one is the nature of the problem that young, primarily African American men, but many low income men generally face with regard to going into the workplace with felonies. Um, last night at the community police meeting, um, there was a young African American woman who's a lawyer, whose name I don't know, who is, was talking about the idea of a clinic um, to help some of these guys get their felonies expunged. This is a hugely good idea. And we should, the city, the Boone County Bar Association, the NAACP, and the city ought to think seriously about putting together a clinic to make this happen. There is a clinic almost just like this going at the law school right now, so there's a lot of expertise on it. And I understand that that's a tiny little piece of the puzzle, but I think I'd rather talk about a tiny little piece than that generic um, problem of, that we, we can all talk generically about the problem. The other thing is, Ian's been a real leader on the, on the transportation subject. Um, and he's actually right about it. And there's another person in this community who's done a lot about it too, and that's Susan Hart. Susan Hart is the recently expired president of the Chamber of Commerce. Now, that points to something really important. If you're going to get to where you want to get to, if you're Ian Thomas on transportation, it means you absolutely have to have buy-in from a large segment of the community. That means that we cannot be at one another's throats. We have to be able to get together on some of this kind of stuff, or you're never, ever, ever going to get the kind of money and the kind of support that Ian needs to change the public transportation system. The tra public transportation system is not going to be funded by the 4% of the left in this community who feels really strongly about it. It's going to be funded by the maybe 65 or 70% of the clump of the city who kind of agrees with it, but doesn't regard it as the number one issue. huh? And to get there, you need to bring people together. You need to be able to cross intellectual, philosophical, and economic lines because you can't do it without the money. Okay, housing. Um, we recently had another round of uh, school district redistricting, you know, school districting, and it uh, usually winds up that the schools are unbalanced in terms of their populations because our neighborhoods are segregated um, economically and racially. So what about housing? What about affordable housing? And um, we know that's a huge issue on the agenda of city, every city council meeting is property zoning, development. What should we do about it? Europe. My first, okay. My son recently returned from Libya in Europe. Um, came back because his wife is not an American citizen and they were afraid, given the current situation in Washington, that she would not have the opportunity to become a citizen if um, things up there are going the way we all have seen with regard to citizenship and, and immigrants and stuff. 
Anyway, where does he live? Where does he move when he comes back? On to Anderson. Um, right in the middle of Central Columbia. Um, and that's given me a new chance to look at it in that neighborhood. Look, there's a whole lot of houses in that neighborhood which, if renovated, would provide wonderful places to live as older people leave them to move back into the central part of the city. And that kind of, I think we need to do a lot more of that, of renovation. You got a lot of, you got a lot of infrastructure in there that needs work too. Um, a lot of infrastructure. It's real serious. Um, but land trust is, is a good model. I think that it is thus far a model rather than a total solution. Um, but I would, I would think that we would, it, it's in all of our interest because it's cheaper to manage the infrastructure in a more densely populated central area than it is if you promote sprawl. Um, but I think that you, we, we ought, it's in everybody's interest. It's economically better, it's environmentally better, um, it's better for sense of community if you are to do those things necessary to refurbish the central part of the city, I think. Uh, according to data from uh, the city's uh, housing department, part of uh, community development, uh, 15 and a half thousand households in Colombia. That's not too far short of half of all households in Colombia are cost burdened at the rate of 30% or more, meaning that they are spending 30% or more of their income on housing and utilities. And research shows that that creates a very precarious financial situation for those households uh, in terms of being able to stay in their homes. And that's the combination of both owner-occupied and, uh, and rental houses. Um, the private market is not building affordable housing for economic reasons, and therefore government needs to take a role. The land trust uh, was a great first step, and I was one of the uh, instigators of that program, uh, establishing the land trust. And the land trust essentially creates permanent affordability out of the uh, subsidies that we receive from the federal government to create affordable housing. Um, and um, that means that we are now growing a portfolio of affordable housing in Colombia. Um, another strategy that I, would, that I do support um, that would actually uh, increase the, the amount of affordable housing much more rapidly is inclusionary zoning. And this is a policy that we don't have in Colombia right now, but I hope we will soon, that many other communities have, that requires a developer who is building a large number of dwelling units, uh, an apartment building complex, or a uh, subdivision, to make a certain percentage of them affordable. And that requires that developer to actually raise the price of the market rate homes slightly in order to provide the subsidies. But it is a strategy that seems to work well in the other communities that I've, that I've looked at. Um, and um, because we're a rapidly growing community, because we're building a lot of houses, if we could get that policy in place, all the new houses are going to be built in the future years, 10% of them will be built affordable according to those federal income uh, formulas and, and cost burden ratios. Another thing that we need to do is to support our existing affordable housing uh, owners and landlords and renters, and I'm learning about this from Mike, and I appreciate your input on that recently, Mike, uh, but I think that there are a lot of policy steps that we can take to support existing affordable housing in the community and put that on a more stable and sustainable uh, footing going forward. We had a question over here about this affordable housing issue. Can I get your opinion on what the price range is for affordable housing? Um, I understand that uh, we're looking at somewhere like $100,000, $110,000 for a smallish three-bedroom house. But I'm, I'm not a technical expert on this. Um, I look for policies and strategies that work and champion those. But I could certainly pass on your question to Randy Cole. Sure. Yeah, I think the conversation around affordable housing is, relates to how much of a person's income uh, is able to be devoted to home uh, lease, purchase, rent, whatever it is. Um, which obviously varies and is related to 
the living wage That's or non living wage yeah. that people make yeah. in a particular community. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So raising wages would be another way to address the problem. We had a meeting last night, I did attend the one at Wilson Local Church. We had a meeting to do with the house, the homeless. And I, one of the things that came up was uh, working with landlords, giving them a fund, helping them to have homes, to help people, low-income homeless, whatever the status, uh, to live, you know, you know like if, it's, if somebody, you know, some way to give a landlord some funds to have make housing available for the. You know, and it wasn't all about affordable, affordable housing. We also was bringing up uh, rebuilding some of the homes that we do have. Because, well, to me, it's just too many homes that are getting tore down. Mm -hmm. And that really kind of messes with the history of the neighborhood. Many of them. Yeah, and as Pat Fowler often points out, we have neighborhoods with a lot of affordable housing in them right now, people are living in them, and they are threatened by, by redevelopment, and protecting that affordable housing is very important. And a lot of them are pretty cool houses, mm -hmm. with some very nice old woodwork and brickwork and that kind of thing, and it seems a shame to lose all that. If we, with a relatively modest investment, if we could present, prevent losing, if we could preserve some of that. So if somebody comes forward and says, I have a great plan for one of these neighborhoods to build a huge student apartment complex, um, how do you um, counter that? I mean, what's the value of a, a neighborhood versus a dollar? Depends on the zoning, doesn't it? Um, it t there's so many. It, it's so hard to make a to answer a, a hypothetical like that because there's so many factors. Well, it hasn't if, been very hypothetical in a lot of our neighborhoods. <laughs> no, no. I get what I'm saying is with the new one though. If the zoning is there already for a multifamily building, the city probably can't stop it. The question is, should the city subsidize it. Um, and my general inclination is that certainly before I would do that I would want Ian's concept of a portion of it set aside for people who could afford to live there. Um, what's its over, is it paying its own way in terms of pressure on the, uh, on the infrastructure, on the sewer, on the electricity, on the water? Um, very hard to say we just are not going to let you do it if you've got the zoning to do it. Um, legally, I mean. But subsidizing is a whole other thing. Oh, and, and so that's something that neighborhood associations have gathered and need to continue to gather to get themselves zoned in a way that protects them. But historically, from the downtown, my understanding is that. Um, that the developers who have overbuilt the student housing downtown did not pay a fair price for the infrastructure, the connection to the city sewer, and so on. And people in the first ward continue to struggle with infrastructure problems to their sewers that have not been that have not been addressed. While the city, all of us have funded the uh, the infrastructure for the student housing that has been overbuilt. Which brings me to another question I hope we get to, which is this business of extending uh, the, the city sewer system to Midwest. Yes, we, we have that on our list. Um, and um, Do we ask to respond to this sure. the question? You're absolutely right about the first ward, but it's not solely limited to the first ward. A lot of neighborhoods find their zoning protections eroded in the fourth ward as most, our most recent example. Do they not? Rothwell recently, um, to its chagrin, found out how fragile its zoning protections were at a recent city council meeting. So it, 
is not just, it is the first ward, and the first ward's particularly vulnerable. Because of its proximity to downtown and its value. Not right? just because of that. Also because the residents of the first ward are, comparatively speaking, less able to protect themselves in that environment because they don't bring the same amount of money to the, to the fight. Um, it, it, exactly, but that's that's their pro the proximity of the first ward to downtown and university. It's a real fact. No is question. Makes, it, it is what it, no, you're absolutely right. right about that. All I'm saying is it's not exclusive to that. When we don't protect neighborhoods with zoning, as we experienced recently in the fourth ward, um, it it spreads around the city. And believe me, if Roswell can't protect itself, <laughs> then there ain't no way people in the first ward are going to be able to protect themselves. Well, I'll take up the um, public infrastructure issue. Um, a lot of people are surprised to learn that it actually costs somewhere between thirty and forty thousand dollars per home to extend public infrastructure to a new home, the average new home in Colombia. That's the number I've come up with by studying uh, cost infrastructure expansion projects for uh, uh, different utilities, different services that have a one-time infrastructure cost associated with expanding from a population of, say, 120,000 to 150,000. Um, the school district uh, contributes a large part of that cost. As, as we know, the school district is building new schools at a very rapid clip at the moment, and all of that money is being paid for by current property taxpayers. Um, logically and fairly, I would argue there should be a connection fee or a development impact fee for schools where the cost for the average new home, uh, the children that that home is going to add to the school system, should be assessed against that, that new home. And that would be the biggest part. But the sewer system, the road system, the electric and water systems, the police system and the fire system, we just had an issue last fall of needing to find $3 million to build a new fire station in South Columbia where there's been a lot of growth. Well, if every one of those homes have been putting as little as, I think it's only $500 in the case of fire, into a pot as those homes were built, we'd have the value of the new, new fire station right there as the growth goes ahead. So I have been campaigning again for many years for fair and logical development impact fees. We do have some good traction now. The current council is pretty well on board with this. We passed in the budget last year, a, uh, I think it was $25,000 or $50,000 to commission a study to uh, analyze several of our public services and the infrastructure costs related to growth in those services and give us these data so we can compare that with what we're actually charging which is minimal. Um, if we can build the political will to charge fair and adequate uh, uh, impact fees, uh, then we will have the funds to do that. We can use our current ratepayers and taxpayers' contributions to do the maintenance and, and operations that uh, our services require instead of robbing them to expand infrastructure for growth. And when do you all expect those studies to take place and to be um, and then to have the results of those studies. Uh, so uh, Carl Scholar and I are leading this effort. We met with Tim Tenney uh, and a couple of other city staff several weeks ago and d discussed and essentially designed the request for proposals that we think we want. Okay. Tim is going to bring that back to a council meeting as a report quite soon, I think. Um, we'll then hopefully, once the whole council gets a chance to review it, uh, ask for it to be brought back as an actual ordinance. We have to pass the ordinance, then we issue the RFP. As always in government, it's a slow process, but um, I would hope we get the results of the of the, yeah, the study completed. It should take about three to six months to do the study um, by the end of the year or early next year. Okay. One more question. I, I don't know, maybe six months, eight months ago, that all blurs. But um, as city council, um, when we talked about um, having kind of a graduated property tax as part of one of the taxing schemes that might be more progressive. What kind of property? Progressive. So, so much like you pay your income tax, you know, yeah. your percentages go up as, you know, but right. you, you're forgiven certain amounts. So for example, city, city of Columbia, the example I used was like, you could forgive 50,000 on everybody's property across this, the city of Columbia. And if that 50,000 is like, say, 50% of your, 30% of your income, that's a huge tax relief. And yes, it will kind of skew like the effective tax rates, but it's, it's an equitable venture. And it's also, it has equality, which is one thing that everybody who has money wants to, preach about, right? 
So everybody's paying equally, or everybody's getting benefited equally, but you're gonna have a very different impact. I think what you asked was, is there any model currently existing out there? And I did find out New Hampshire and New York City are both feeling direct rebates in that, in that regard. But there's numerous um, examples where you can treat it just like an income tax system. And that by itself should be within the purview of the city council to enact that kind of property tax legislation, correct? Um, it, it might be. It certainly sounds like a great idea and something that I would support. Um, but the taxes are actually collected by the Boone County, um, or it is set by the Boone County Assessor and collected by the collector. And they're divided up and there are portions go to the city and the county and the school district and the library district and, and some others. Um, so it would probably have to be a coordinated effort. Um, but um, I like the idea of progressive taxes. Yes. It's much bigger than that because the basis for property tax assessment is state and it's constitutional. Um, and so you couldn't, I think that you couldn't change it in a locality. Um, uh, it's conceivable that I'm wrong about that, but I don't think that I am. Second, what do you, assume that you could, what do you need to get there? 51%, <laughs> right, of the people voting on it. Because that, that absolutely is a public vote question. And in order to get there on any of this stuff, even on things far more modest than that, because that's a, a huge change in our approach to public life, isn't it? To get to far more modest stuff like that, you have to have buy-in uh, pretty much across the political spectrum. I have one more related question to all of this. So we talked about the connection, the impact fees, the connection fees, and we also talked about the actual real cost of what a, an affordable housing model looks like. Um, some of the information that we've had come back from some of the developers is that based on the fees assessed by the City of Columbia, they cannot turn a profit unless their affordable housing is like closer to the $200,000 range, which of course is not really helpful for us. How do we close that <coughs> gap between what the developers are saying a house cost versus what our local income can actually support? Because there seems to be a pretty big difference. Um, I, I think the situation you describe, which is accurate, is a reflection of the enormous wealth disparity in our country as a whole. And um, I think the way we do it right now, you know, the federal uh, housing and you know, uh, uh, urban development department uh, provides significant grants all across the country to bridge that gap uh, in the form of uh, home and community development block grants, so, but it only does a handful in, in a city like Columbia, so it's a very slow process. The inclusionary zoning uh, approach that I described seems to me to be a way to more systematize that um, by, um, develop, by gaining the subsidy from market rate housing and uh, um, requiring, or, or it can be an incentive-based program as well, that uh, uh, we can offer incentives such as density bonuses and um, reduced parking requirements and things like that that developers really want. Um, I think that the way that we culturally build houses in Colombia, uh, and so many on detached houses on single lots is problematic. In England, you see uh, every city, the m vast majority of the homes are row houses, connected walls. They are quite small. I lived, I lived in two or three different ones at different times of my, of my, my growing up. And um, they must be very uh, reasonable, affordable costs. You see an example of that on, um, uh, just across from Columbia College at the moment. Um, and I believe those are actually done as apartments, but if a building like that could be done as a condominium, then it seems to me that the costs would have to be a whole lot lower. And, and they might come into the affordable housing cap category. Um, but I'm not an expert on this. I'm learning and I'm just trying to push for the good outcome that we want. One of the things that drives the builders crazy is uncertainty. If you're doing a development, and all of a sudden you're 13 months into the development, and the city tells you, oh, you need to pay another $105,000 out of the clear blue sky, that is just 
a fury, as you can well imagine. I believe that the developer community is prepared to talk seriously about different levels of cost for development, but I think that what they're going to want back, as well as some of the things that Ian talks about, is a, a greater sense of certainty. That whatever it is that they're going to have to pay, that's what they're going to have to pay. That they don't get, they don't get down the road having <clears throat> invested a half a million dollars and find out that their numbers are off because the city comes up with a new $105,000 that they have to pay. That drives them nuts, as you can well imagine. Well, having sat in city council meetings where developers have ignored existing city rules and then come to that's true too and then come to request uh, an exception and they have violated all kinds of city rules including things that the ADA would require or would previously have required uh, so so I mean I think that cuts both ways sure it cuts both ways the, and, the, um, the issue is that we can't get there alone. None of this stuff is going to happen without relatively significant across the political spectrum buy-in. We as a community cannot change things that are very big without relatively widespread buy-in. During my entire time in the legislature, nothing in both, both Democratic and Republican legislatures, big things don't happen as a result of a slim, tiny majority, or certainly not a majority of the minority. And so it's really important that we remember that if we're going to make progress in Columbia, Missouri, that we need to get pretty across, we need to get pretty widespread buy-in. We can't go very far shoving stuff down one another's throats. It just doesn't work. What's uh, the motivation for um, high income or affluent Colombians to support things like affordable housing, jobs programs, health programs, some of the social equity goals that the Mayor's Task Force recommended? You know, what is the What's your message to them if they're the majority of the voters? Here's what it is. It's that we live in a, not unique, but an unusual community when there's lots of people in those houses who believe, fundamentally believe in those things as a matter of their own principles. I can see six or eight people in this room who fit in that exact category, who live in those houses, and who believe in those values. And that's much, think of that. Think of med, med center doctors. Med center, you can't swing a dead cat in this town without hitting a med center, <laughs> a med center doctor. And yet lots and lots of those people will be supportive of lots of those kinds of goals. Um, because they fundamentally, personally, believe in them. And that's not true in a lot of towns of our size and affluence. So I think we are in, as I say, not unique, but an unusual, we have an unusual ability to push that that boundary further than many communities. Yeah, I agree with that. I think it takes advocacy groups like yourselves and political leadership to make that happen. I do think people want to do the right thing. And if we can build a vision of an equitable society here, uh, many people with, with means will buy in and will be willing to uh, uh, pay more progressive taxes and support the creation of a community where everybody can thrive. Um, I want to just quickly go back to the, the, the burden on the developers of these connection fees and just make one other point that, that, that I, I believe uh, mitigates that burden, certainly. I don't support uncertainty for business people. It's a nightmare. I've run businesses myself. Um, and the talk about big increase in development fees must be very concerning for people who make their living out of that and what that's going to do to all their calculations and so on. But 
what I would like to propose if we are to increase the development impact fees to adequately cover the cost of infrastructure expansion, that these fees are not charged all in one go at the time that the permit is, inter is, is issued, but that they can be essentially amortized or uh, tax billed into the owner of the new home, maybe over 10 years. So that $35,000 that we're short on every house could be spread over 10 years to adequately um, refund the uh, city's infrastructure accounts to pay for the growth that that, that house demanded. I knew there was a reason why I liked you. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, we have obviously more questions than we can handle, and um, we had had a request that we would talk about Henderson Branch, but I'd rather just because that's another example of somebody wanting something in the city that um, wasn't necessarily um, a social justice goal. But um, are there any other um, questions from the audience, from the participants that, huh? yes? Well, Henderson Branch would <coughs> presumably be an issue where the two of you would disagree sharply. You voted against it, and Judge Kelly is running on a platform that supports it. Has any of that changed? And, and I believe you, Councilman Thomas, voted against it twice. Yeah, at least twice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, so, I, 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 my, my position I hasn't changed. You've been pretty, you know, together on her. But that's this is an issue mm -hmm. where I would think you two would be quite separate. May, may well be absolutely true. <laughs> so okay. my position has not changed. Um, I see the Henderson branch not so much as a taxpayer handout to a few developments in terms of the cost of the sewer. That to me is the small part of the problem. That's the $4.3 million problem. The real problem is that once that sewer is built, the pressure to annex hundreds and hundreds of acres on the west side of the Perchy Creek to build thousands of homes there, each one of which will be grabbing a $35,000 subsidy from our current taxpayers. That's the real that's problem. The problem. And that's why I have steadfastly opposed an annexations uh, west of the Perchy, or in general tried to oppose annexations uh, because of uh, until we have adequate, fair, and logical um, development impact fees in place so that growth is really paying for itself. Absolutely. Here's why I differ. There's two big reasons. The first is environmental. If we don't do Henderson Branch sewer, that means two new big lagoons right in the upper part of the Percy Creek Basin. Now, anybody who's lived here for a long time knows that Boone County has fought with sewage lagoons forever. And they've been failures forever. And these new ones will be failures too. It will produce another environmental nightmare going into Percy Creek. There's just no way. You know, they'll say the lagoons are going to be right. Anybody who's lived here a long time knows the lagoons are never going to be right. It's going to, there's going to be, I mean, Andrew, Jeff, you guys have been here a long time. You've seen it over and over and over again. The lagoons are a problem. Second, and this is, I refer back to when I said that we have to get along with one another. There is a significant part of this community who believes that as in the bond issue, when I was part of passing that bond issue, and I believe this to be true, that there was a promise made I agree that there was not a specific in the bond language promise made, but there's no question that there was a significant representation made to the business community of Columbia, Missouri, that if the bond issue passes, Henderson Branch will be done. To go back on that promise is a killer in terms of lots and lots of future cooperation. I cite, for example, we will within, what, 18 months have to go back and get the park sales tax renewed? Isn't it? It's about 18 months or two years? Yeah, we did it in 2015. I care a lot about the park sales tax. 
if you go out there and try to get this park sales tax renewed, having broken the trust of that part of the community, you're going to have hell to pay getting 50% of the vote because you're going to see a systematic campaign against it. And that goes across the board. If you try to come to an agreement on development fees, that means any significant increase in development fees whatsoever, and you have broken trust with regard to Henderson Branch, you are going to be dead in the water on changing um, sewer fees. These, and these are just two examples of which there are many. If you have to go back for a law enforcement tax, um, and you don't have trust in the community, you are not going to pass it. And let me, I'll finish it up now. This is why I am so strong on this. Because I think that when the community, this community has two incredibly important tense poles, don't we, that makes it so great. One is the kind of chamber of commerce business poll. The other one is kind of maybe we see as university liberal um, poll on the other side. That, and these are not monolithic or exact representation at all. But it's kind of a, the two great forces in our community. And if they cannot have some modicum of trust, we cannot make serious progress on the big issues. There's another huge issue that I care about, and that is that of cut, cutting our carbon footprint. If you think you can make any dent in carbon footprint at all without absolute, without actual buy-in and participation from that other great poll, you are politically incorrect. Two quick responses to what you said, Chris. Um, I agree that we don't want to go about making promises and breaking promises, and I wasn't part of the promise. Um, and when we have, you know, uh, uh, large institutions making policy and making decisions, there's going to be shades of opinion within within that. Um, but I don't think the trust issue is as bad as you as you state it. I think that um, we can uh, present the uh, the big picture impacts of either doing it or not doing it. And I'm not opposed to to building the Henderson Branch sewer if we have adequate. Uh, fees. I didn't in say place. that. We we ought to have buy-in. We shouldn't do it without buy-in from the people getting served. Economic buy-in, I mean. But given the economic buy-in and given the need to produce to to um, hold to the trust, I think we have huge problems here if we go away from it. And second, on an engineering point, I'm not convinced that we can't build. Uh, perfectly good small scale <laughs> sewer treatment plants. What is the McBain plant other than a than, than a, a, a well performing sewage treatment plant? So I don't see why everything has to drain to the McBain plant. Why we can't use uh, modern technology to create good plants? And I ask repeatedly um, uh, the Boone County Sewer District and Mr. Potterfield uh, and our sewer managers what it would cost Midway USA and Midway Truck Stop to build, and, and I, I could never get anybody to answer that question, but I suspect it may not be much more than just building the Henderson Branch sewer. Okay. Well, thank question. you, it's eight o'clock. You guys yeah. are done with the, the Yes. Okay. Well, we are, we are, I just I wondered about this trust issue, and it seems like uh, getting back to the goals of RMF, um, the people whose trust we are most committed to um, the city appealing to are different from the people that we, it sound, sounds like we are almost um, captive of this, the, what you call the, the communities, um, the business communities trust. And I don't want to feel that um, the equity interests are captive of that need for trust. I think we're captive of one another. I don't think that it's captive on one side. I think, you know, you know, my as you know, my entire career has been on the equity side of that equation. Um, my entire career, everything that I've done in the legislature, everything I did as county clerk and before then was on the equity side of that agenda. But I think we are clear, the money's got to come from somewhere, the political buy-in's got to come from somewhere, the fight to make the change has got to come from somewhere else. All these things, we are, we are 
kept, I think we're captains of one another. And maybe that's healthy. Mm -hmm. I just think that, it, you know, as with Brexit, uh, it was voted for with inadequate information. And many people, I believe, would say, let's, now that we know what the real implications are, let's vote again. I wish that could happen. And the amount that it would cost to, to do this extension was more than double. And I think it's an empirical question as to whether this trust issue, how, how big it is, because the people who are in development specifically, Mr. Potterfield in particular, they are, I believe, a minority. I do not believe that they are the majority of Colombians. And so, you know, this business of his... It doesn't have anything to do with Potterfield. Okay. It doesn't have anything I don't think it does. I think liberal and conservative sewage both flows downhill. <laughs> and um, I, I think that this, I think this is, a, I've been doing politics a long time. I think it's a death knell issue to cooperation for a long period of time. That's why I care about it. Because well, I think that it as long as one group gets to decide it's a death knell, yeah. But um, both sides get to deny it. Most of the people that we try to appeal to don't feel like they have a death knell over everybody else. So, <laughs> um, well, you know, I, it, it, it concerns me that one group of interest can say, unless you go along with us, it's a death knell. Uh -huh. You know, no, I, I hear you. But that's, uh, that's I, I don't mean it's another good argument. I think there is another good argument. But I think it's a way to to manifest trust. And then we're back, we're back okay. our time boundary. Our time. <laughs>